Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Welcome to this episode of the Australian Finance Podcast, in which we are talking red flags. Kate, it's my pleasure to have you with me. It is good to be back, Owen, specifically ASX company red flags or yes. things to look for when you're investing in individual companies or for companies you've already invested in that might raise your eyebrows a little bit and warrant further investigation. Yes, indeed. So these are the things that uh, you probably hear professional investors talk about. They say red flag, there was a red flag and I made a mistake. Um, there is, this is a red flag, that's a red flag. You see it all, you hear it all the time. And it's not just in investing, people use this phrase elsewhere. Danger. Danger, yeah. So first of all then, Kate, what is a red flag? Why do we use that idea? The way I'm thinking about red flags is it's something that I should pay a bit more attention to as an investor about the company, whether it's suddenly the CEO left in the middle of night Mm -hmm. out of nowhere and no one had any idea that was going to happen. And this thing might not break your investment case or the reasons you invest that company and the company might be fine, but it's something that you would go, okay, I'm going to do a bit more research into why this happened. Does this affect my thesis? And should I still invest in this company? Should I sell? What should I do about it? Yep. Okay. So red flags are often uh, interpreted to by people to mean or sell now. So a lot of people are like, oh, that's a red flag, I should have sold. And um, I think we just want to stress that it's maybe not always the case that you find one red flag and then you yeah. sell. I think a better system is a traffic light system like red, orange, green. Um, green being good, orange being not good but not terrible uh, and red being like it's, that's, not, that's not good. Uh, and when you invest, it's important to remember that there are many different uh, – flags that you'll come across when we looked at companies for rask invest we would have uh, 42 different checklist items and they would each of those different items would then have a score and then it's only from that score that we then make a decision whether to go through with further research now if one of those was a red flag we could still proceed because the other 41 might be okay and you're always going to find a company that has something you don't like. That's just what happens in investing. Yeah. So and keep I think that in the mind. other thing to keep in mind is we can't see usually the inner workings of the company. We don't know what's going through people's minds. We don't know all of the secret conversations that are being held, the private and confidential stuff. So we have to make educated decisions based off the publicly available information or by listening to the uh, investor calls or reading the documents, doing research on forums, things like that. So um, it's important. Some of these can add up. So you might see a combination of different factors make you a bit hesitant about investing in that company. Yep. So it's, it's things that it might not be one thing that makes or breaks it, but it could be a combination of these things. And sometimes yeah. when one of these red flags occurs, it can actually be a good time to invest in that company because it's actually a good opportunity when no one loves the company, but it's still over the long term going to do good things. So what you're saying, Kate, is your red flag might be my green light. Yes, you're quoting <laughs> me now. <laughs> That's one of Kate's famous oh, lines. I, yeah, I Please wrote quote, that. The, quote it, put it on a T-shirt. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we've seen that in many companies. Sometimes when things are going wrong at the company and no one loves it, it actually, on if you look at the long-term chart, can be the best time to buy that company. But it can also be the sign of even worse things to come. So it's really hard to know um, and it takes a lot of judgment and even the best investors get it wrong. Yeah. But I guess in today's episode, we really want to talk about some of the key things that would raise our, our eyebrows, maybe that act as red or amber flags to us yep. um, that we really want to look into further. Um, but even, I don't know if you want to talk a bit more about when a red flag or an amber flag might be okay. Yeah, I mean, there are heaps of times. Um, the interpretation of results is basically what it comes down to. So um, a good one is with management teams. People believe, and you'll see this on social media, on Twitter, Reddit, Instagram, wherever you get your um, social media. Basically, you'll see 
uh, someone says, oh, the, the founder is selling their shares, like or some of their shares. Uh, therefore, that's a red flag I should sell now. Uh, and yes, you know, there's a famous saying that is um, CEOs buy shares for one reason, they sell for many. And the idea is that when a CEO who runs the company buys shares in the companies that they run, it means that they think it's a good investment, right? And they have all the information, so they would know. Uh, but then when they sell, they sell because it could be like tax, it could be divorce settlement, it could be they think the shares are overvalued, which is what you're really scared about. It could be something bad inside the company, which is another thing you're really scared about. So it could be any one of these reasons. But people interpret that signal as red all the time when it might be amber. So it might be just a chance to pause. Uh, there was a good example of this not too long ago when there was a uh, the chairman of a company sold some shares and just some shares, the share, the company came out with an announcement a few weeks later saying, you know, results aren't as good as expected. The share price cratered like 40%. Then the companies, like all these lawyers start circling, trying to say, like get shareholders together for a, um, for what do you call it? A class action. When really this chairman was in his seventies and has dedicated to giving his money away every year at equal amounts. And so that was the reason for the sale. Yeah, and founders shouldn't be expected to hold on to their shares indefinitely. You can imagine that many that have done well with their company want to use the money to start a new company or for philanthropic endeavors or to buy a new house. Yeah, or even just sell. Like some of them, like say, for example, myself, uh, a lot of people that start businesses have almost all of their wealth tied up in one thing. Yeah, they so, want to diversify yeah, after so they, decades. They want to do it too. And that's another thing that happens is people with that scenario – is someone sells after they go from CEO to just a director. Like a lot of CEOs, when they come to the ASX um, and are founders or whatever, they've been actually, like we only hear about them when they get to the stock market, but they've been running the company for like 10, sometimes 20 years. And so when the reason for them getting to the stock market is actually so that then they can take a backwards step and just go to like a director's position and they find someone to replace. And a lot of people see that as like a really bad thing. Oh, the founder's resigning and all this stuff stuff. Yeah, it could be, but it also could be time for that person to do that. So yeah. yeah. And if you're a new investor and you wanted to learn a little bit more about how red flags, like say these big events have either done been a good time or a bad time to invest historically, would you maybe choose some companies where things big things have happened as sort of a case study to actually yeah, see if could. there's any patterns and learn more because you're new to it, so you haven't seen this in your own company. There have been a lot of uh, there have been a lot of podcasts done over the years about different investment process. So that's what we cover on the Australian Investors podcast. We cover the investment process of different investors in Australia, and that's really insightful because you get to hear their lessons learned. So they kind of distill that through their lessons. But I mean, we'll through each of the ten different types of flags, red flags that we're going to outline. I'm hopefully going to bring one example. So if you're interested in that. Uh, company and that example go ahead and research it to see what actually happened and i think actually learning by investigating yourself is the single most important thing you can do when you're an investor yeah so should we jump into the 10 let's crack on red slash amber slash potentially green lights yeah green lights my green light your red flag or yeah yeah i think i got the green light concept from matthew mcconaughey's book green yeah. lights um, yeah he's deep voice yeah he's like green light yeah when an opportunity sort of presented itself he didn't know at the time when it was actually a great opportunity for him <laughs> look at you yeah. weaving that into this i would highly recommend that audiobook if someone wants I've a nice soothing audiobook his voice yeah it's good yeah, okay so the very first red flag is a pro- poor approach to environmental social and governance issues now this doesn't have to be seen as a ethical investor point of view, but I think they're a good way to categorize it. So any issues that a company is involved in. So you can kind of use this as a filter per se for looking at some of those different things that pop up. But I think it's, you all see companies in the media that have been caught or made a mistake doing something wrong. They've um, had a faulty product. Maybe there's been a product recall and maybe they've had a bad interaction with a client online and it's how they respond to these situations that interest me more. Like Mm. people make mistakes, companies make mistakes. Sometimes they're on purpose. Um, But I think it's more about looking at how the company responds. And sometimes companies just pretend nothing happened or they try to keep it secret. So sometimes things come out that the company hid 
something for 10 years that their pesticide was really causing cancer in a particular county town. So yeah, that's more like of that. the, yeah. So that's like an Aaron, Brock, Aaron Brockovich type thing. Those things are pretty rare. So if you come across that, that would be a very, very strong red flag for most investors. Um, but like there are, there are probably more uh, amber shades of ESG flags than there are, or orange flags than there are red flags. But I would say in Australia, you know, example of this recently would have been Len- Lendlease, which trades under the ASX. I think its ticker symbol is LLC. Um, and there was an issue, I believe it was in New South Wales, where there was a development site and there were koalas there. Uh, and there's this whole issue because Australian Ethical then invested in them. Uh, he's invested in Lendlease. So, um, you know, that's an example of where there's like an environmental and social issue um, that's boiled over. Uh, but there are many other things. Like you can see, like, say, the way energy companies have responded to climate change. So like AGL committing to divesting in da 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 many decades from now and many of the other energy companies doing the same. And this is probably, I'd say this this type of flag is actually more a personal flag because as we know, ethical investing kind of boils down to what your tolerance is for certain things. So, um, yeah, I mean, you would look at that and then you would make your own decision. Yeah. Yeah, I just think it's like interesting to see how a company responds to when things come up. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes many of these companies... We're just talking about boards of directors. Uh, sometimes these companies actually don't know everything that they're involved in. It sounds silly to say, but you know, like bank CEOs. Uh, bank CEOs are often the ones where the you know guillotine falls and they're chopped off, and the new CEO comes in because of some grandma in rural WA they've got a loan that shouldn't have, and blah blah blah. And sometimes that that could be like ten different layers of management. Obviously, there is some accountability, but you've got to take the, the context of the um, the issue as well into account, I think. And um, yeah, sure, the banks have a history of really bad um, governance, internal governance, and the con- conflicts of interest. So that's an example of, I guess, an industry that has been very, very slow to respond and very poorly res- has responded to those things. But um, many of those banks took years to pay for the remediation that took place. So there's an example of... Um, a social and I guess a governance issue becoming a financial issue. Number two. All right. The second one is poor treatment of employees, suppliers and customers. And that kind of connects a little bit to the first one, but I think it's important to expand on that because I think if a company doesn't treat its employees, its suppliers, its customers well, I don't know if you can really trust them to look after shareholders over the long term. Like, are they going to leave the company in a good place? And whether that's talking to employees at stores and seeing how they're treated, are they actually getting paid properly? Um, Whether it's looking at Glassdoor or Seek and looking at reviews people have left of the company. Um, Sometimes you can see people have posted Google reviews. Now you always have to take these with a grain of salt because sometimes it's like one or two disgruntled customers that go and just um, put one-star reviews everywhere. Um, but I do think it's important to see how they um, interact with their employees because especially for big companies where it's like hard to get specific tech employees, that they could leave if they're not treated well. Yeah. Um, and if the company um, isn't sort of like respecting them and having good policies in place and actually making sure it's a safe um, and fair workplace. Yeah, and um, I, yeah, I think you said it really well. Uh, and you mentioned like the review websites. These are probably our only insight into those. So the review websites like Glassdoor, Seek and Indeed, um, depending on the country where your like company is located, are probably the best source of this. So you can go onto Glassdoor and you can see the ratings of different companies. Uh, I should call out that um, Raymond Jang and myself did an episode on the Australian Investors Podcast called Culture Killers. And we talked about, uh, we got there's like 50 companies or 100 companies in our database that we looked at all of their HR scores and then we looked at the the, kind of the standout anomalies. And what we found there was that some companies have really poor HR reviews on websites because their employees just aren't motivated to go and talk about it. Like say Silicon Valley companies like Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, whatever. Those companies have huge amounts of reviews because they're big um, and because they're trying to attract talent. But if you look at an Australian company like ARB Corp, this is the bull bars business. It's one of Australia's most successful investments over the past 20 years. It has very few reviews and very poor reviews. 
on Google. And so you could be thrown off. You could treat that as a red flag and then you'd be like, oh, well, that's actually not indicative of the entire company. Another good one is uh, companies like Flight Center where if you compared Google to Flight Center, you would have totally different expectations. At Google, you have, have a high performance environment, sure, just like you do at Flight Center, but you would have bean bags and free fruit and colorful areas. At Flight Center, you've got a small room, you've got, um, I guess, a really intense sales environment. So you end up with two totally different workplaces and it's horses for courses. So the reviews that you get from Flight Center might not be the same as the reviews you get from Google. So those red flags that you look at may actually not necessarily be red flags. They might be amber flags, but it is important to keep a check on because particularly technology companies, they're, they rely on good quality employees. Yeah, and even having a, a good search for a, a companies, if there's any articles about them um, underpaying staff yeah, like, or not paying superannuation or if there have been any legal issues where um, an employee has taken the company to court over a discrimination issue or an unfair dismissal issue even those things are interesting to keep in mind to help form that picture but they're only a small part of the picture because it's quite hard to see externally maybe you can even go to stores if they have them and talk to yeah, the yeah, employees for sure. and That's see great. how they enjoy their workplace if it is a place with a store yeah. um, and you also kind of got to understand as you said who's leaving those reviews yeah. um, it might be a company that does something specific that people don't like so they might just jump on and leave a review a lot of people will be like oh i'd never invest in that company if they work for it like if they work at woolies they'd be like, oh, i'd never invest in woolies because they work at woolies and they've had a shit time but that's got nothing to do with the other 30 to 40 thousand and 50 thousand 100 thousand employees whatever that do enjoy it so um it's important to remember that you know to see the forest from the trees that happens a lot like a lot of people are just a small cog in a very big wheel in their organization and they think that their experience is indicative of the entire experience. And um, as analysts and as investors, our job is to look at the entire business um, to identify if certain people are material, which is actually the next one that we're talking about, and then to determine, okay, well, what's the appropriate culture for that business? So if I saw, for example a few negative reviews on Woolworths, I wouldn't be as worried. But if I saw a few negative reviews on a company that only had 30 employees, then I would start to get worried. So, uh, and that may be in fact a red flag. Mm. And it's also interesting, like a global investment bank with 200,000 employees, the culture is going to look very different all over the world in different offices and how that shapes. Yeah. So it's um, yeah, just one piece of the picture, but something important to have on your checklist, I think. Yes. Now the next one, which probably would bring my attention a lot more is that many key personnel, whether that's um, chairperson of the board, directors of the board, the CEO, the CMO, the COO, all of those C-suite executive roles leaving within a short period mm -hmm. um, or without any notice. Yep. This happens a lot. So I think you're going to use the example of Amazon. Yes. Yeah. So um, when Jeff Bezos stepped down as CEO and just um, please step onto the board. Yes. Yes. Yeah. They gave uh, months and months of notice to shareholders that this was going to be happening and that there was a clear process in place and that they'd be looking for the next CEO. Uh, I think they hired internally. Um, mm, yeah, let me I can't remember. That fact, but <laughs> yeah, that's all right. But this hap but that's the ideal outcome. Yeah. You want that to be the outcome where someone who has been integral to a business for such a long time um, gives plenty of notice. Whereas a recent example, um, a very recent example was a company in Australia called EML Payments, which trades under the ticker symbol EML. The CEO, Tom Creek, and who I've interviewed before, um, Tom stepped down from the board uh, and from his CEO role, he retired entirely with one day's notice by the sounds of it. Uh, and the company gave the worst announcement i've ever seen they basically said um yeah tom has stepped down they didn't even give him a quote normally they give him a quote like he'd been i think he'd been with the company for 12 years and had overseen his growth in that time and they didn't give him a quote um it was only like a couple of days later he made a post on linkedin which then he made private <laughs> um that it seemed to suggest that it was all like personal reasons but no one had any idea so it was just like shock and awe the shares got sold down and that company has been littered with issues from compliance issues recently. So um, it was a really tough one. And then there's another one, which was um, 
uh, speaking of like key man risk or key person risk, I was in Magellan, uh, co-founder Hamish Douglas. He'd been the CEO, and, or not CEO, the chief investment officer for a very, very long time, basically run the business. Uh, and, and he was also the face of the business. He was the face really. of the business, He's yeah. who all the investors knew about. Yeah, and that's the way it seemed to me. That's the way it seemed to me. He liked it for that period. And in that time, um, he, you know, he went through some issues where the company was underperforming and the, the tabloid media like the AFR and that um, got really tabloidy and focused on him as a person and started kind of like almost attacking him. And then as his firm begin, began to underperform, it got worse. And then he decided to step back. The, then customers started pulling their money from Magellan because Magellan invests money for other businesses and individuals. And then it just got worse and worse and worse. And so he was a key person that left. Uh, and then there's, since then, there's been a couple of other people leave. Uh, but then a couple of people come back and he's come back. Yeah. So In a different capacity. In a different capacity, yeah. So I think when you see these types of things, one person leaving is probably not a big deal. But when multiple people leave, it's a big deal. Like we've seen at Pinterest recently, Pinterest um, being the social media and image platform, um, heaps and heaps and heaps of their key people have left. So that's like a, a bit of a concern. Yeah. When you're yeah. losing so much of your your key knowledge and your talent at yeah. once. Yeah. And it's I think it comes down to like what notice, is there a succession period? If there's a key person, are they going to take any important accounts or clients with them or would the accounts or clients leave if they weren't there? Because yeah. that does happen sometimes. The only reason you invest in this particular fund is because you like that portfolio manager. And if they're not there, well, you'll go somewhere else. Yeah. And some clients do follow that portfolio manager around. Like you might go to a different hairdresser because your hairdresser has moved to a different salon. People do that in finance as well. Yeah, yeah, I do it. And uh, it happens with companies. It happens everywhere. So the Magellan example is really sensitive because, yeah, you said you trust the person that's investing your money and you trust their views. You see them on the television. Um, whereas if it's say Jeff Bezos at Amazon with millions of employees, it's not as big of a deal nowadays because he's created a business that runs itself. So yeah. Uh, the next one is lack of insider ownership. And this is something that I always look for. In fact, I have to have it when I invest. Yes. A reason for so it. looking at whether the board, especially the chairperson, the CEO and some of the key management actually have skin in the game and are invested in the company or are they just there for the paycheck? Yep. So this is pretty straightforward. If the person that runs your business or the directors run that oversee the person who runs the business uh, own shares, they're more vested in its outcome. So uh, if it's you know a good company, they are going to benefit. So you want to look look in the annual report uh, where it's got the directors report and there's a, a remuneration and it has director interests, aka shareholding. Um, then in the United States, there's a thing called a proxy report, which is a separate document to the annual report. And then in Australia, we've done our uh, uh, ASX announcements podcast where we just went through the top 10. And one of those was a change of director's interest notice. So in Australia, if a director, including a CEO, owns shares of a company and they decide to sell, they have to notify the stock market. But that, 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 that's happened within a couple of days, I believe. So if that happens... Um, you will see how many shares they still hold before and after. You know, they do that whole thing. So uh, that's probably, I think, if, again, at the top of the show, we talked about them selling. If they sell a little bit of their shares, no big deal. One thing that I like to do is I like to look at their, if I can have any understanding of how many shares they own, try and work out what they're worth versus what I think they might be personally worth outside of um the company like maybe they're already a billionaire or something so it's not a big deal um but i try and compare it to that and if they're not a, like a multi-billionaire or whatever i try and compare it to their annual salary so say for example someone that has 10 million dollars worth of shares in the companies that they run in the company that they run and their annual salary from work is a million dollars that means that they've got 10 years worth of shares in the companies that they 10 years worth of salary so they're not going to stuff it up for like a quick buck they're just not going to take that risk so that's some of the things that I look yeah at. that's probably a good point to see if it's meaning for them to them because they might have ten thousand dollars invested in the company but if they're they're only earning a hundred thousand dollars and that's quite a lot whereas if they're already worth a hundred million dollars ten thousand dollars 
invest in the company isn't actually that meaningful to them. That's only a tiny portion of their net worth. Yeah, that's it. So um, that's a, I guess, a, a big thing to keep in mind. Keep in mind is like some people see directors selling, and they might sell like a million dollars, and we're like, wow, they sold a million dollars, but then they've got you know a hundred million dollars left over. Like um, the ProMedicus ASX PME is the ticket code. Um, it's a company that I own shares in, by the way. Uh, ProMedicus is a health company. It's the best performing stock on the ASX for the last 10 years, maybe even the past 20 years as well. Um, and this company, co-founders from the 1980s, they owned about, I think, I'm going to make a mistake, about 33% of the company each. I wouldn't know. Yeah, and they, or maybe it was 33 million shares or whatever, but they slowly sold a million shares at a time. And that was like $30 million, $20 million. But they sold three in three trances or three different blocks. And every time they sold, everyone was like, the founder's selling, the co-founder's selling, whatever. They they sold at one point and they sold again and they sold again. And all three of those prices are below the current share price, like way below. So even they didn't expect it. You could argue that the shares are overvalued, but that's another thing. A different argument, yeah. yes. <laughs> um, just one final thing here, which is something you brought up before the show. Um, you can check the CEO's LinkedIn profile and one CEO in particular was a CEO who kind of jumped around a lot. And in his LinkedIn profile, it said technology CEO. It didn't even say CEO of, it just said technology CEO, uh, which is like a tiny little flag in itself that's like, well, why don't you just write CEO of? Like, why don't you take pride? Why don't you say, this is where I work? Um, And he eventually departed and he was a terrible CEO. So (laughs) there you go. Um, Okay, I might introduce this next one, which is like, having um, the industry change, uh, whether you're jumping on the bandwagon or whether you're not up to date with the industry. So the company just doesn't seem to be, you know, abreast of what's happening in this industry because you've got a really interesting example here. Yeah, I think this red flag, Amber Light, takes a little bit longer to emerge. It's not something you're going to see in an instant ASX announcement or just Mm -hmm. one article. But if you think about, everyone knows about the Blockbuster and Netflix examples. So Blockbuster, you used to go and get your videos and DVDs Mm -hmm. and rent them out for a couple of days and return them through the slot. They didn't grow. And so I think there's only like one Blockbuster store left in the world. I'm not sure what happened to it. Um, but that's when I last It's a museum now. <laughs> yeah, Did probably. you know Netflix, uh, Blockbuster had the chance to buy Netflix? Yeah. They turned well, them down? They, they might not Netflix. have been able to turn Netflix into what it is today. And Netflix started off um, as a DVD in the mail business. I remember yeah. growing up getting those DVDs in the post and you'd watch them and then you'd send them back. Mm. Um, but now Netflix has evolved to what everyone wants in streaming. But now Netflix has its own competitors. So it's going to be interesting to see how that evolves. I saw it's trying to introduce games within yeah. Netflix now. Yeah. So I'm not sure how that's going to go. Yeah, they were pretty trashy, like um, pretty crappy games. But that's honest, an but... example of like one industry two companies in a similar industry, one evolving to what people want. People want to watch shows on the go on their iPad. They don't want to have to put a DVD into a machine to yep. watch it versus Blockbuster where they didn't really evolve and people don't want to go to a store. To, mm. everyone, people want things now in their home without leaving. So um, I think that's important to keep in mind. Like is the company, the company might be amazing today, but it might not be amazing in five years time because they don't evolve with what people want. Um, and, I think there's always that example when they say they look at the top 10 companies in the US on the stock exchange 50 years ago versus what that looks like today. And it's a very different list. Mm. Yeah, it is. Um, I, I, a, a, a different example would be Tesla buying Bitcoin. <laughs> uh, Tesla bought Bitcoin when it was very uh, topical. Uh, and I think they ended up making money, but they just sold all their Bitcoin. So um yeah i mean maybe it's like to do with accounting maybe it's to do with they were accepting regulation. payment in bitcoin for a while it could still be i don't know but yeah i mean it's that's an example of a company jumping on the bandwagon so to speak um like oh bitcoin's going to be the the world's currency or whatever um and maybe yes. yeah but, but be mindful like is the company actually thinking through its strategy or is it just jumping onto whatever's hot at the time because yeah. um, it's easy to lose focus and not actually put the time in for research and development if you're just jumping onto whatever the newest thing is. True. I think there was another example, this, this oh, other yeah. example, which <laughs> I thought was interesting. There was an example in the US. I remember talking about it um, many years ago at work, but there was a company called Long Island Iced Tea in the US mm-hmm. and then they changed their name in 2017 to Long Blockchain Corp. And they originally they sold iced tea and then suddenly they're like, oh, we're going to do all these things. But there was actually some 
in July of last year, actually, there was some insider trading uh, charges announced against three of their large investors who actually uh, had notice of the name change beforehand. Because what happened on the day this name change happened and they announced they're going in this new direction because 2017, like blockchain was, whoa. Yeah, well. And the price went up. Um, these these investors sort of insider traded based off that information and sold the stock after it gained as much as 380%. So, um, and the oh, company, heck. I looked at the website and the social media, looks like nothing's happened for quite a few years. So I'm not sure if it still exists, but um, definitely not the same as it was. But I don't think they really ended up doing what they said they were going to do. Well, that's, yeah, that's a red flag and it sounds like a dog of a company anyway. So that's, yeah, fair enough. So a red flag is like a company jumping on the bandwagon. Yeah. Yeah. Makes or sense. not jumping not, on not, a bandwagon. Not, not evolving at all, not, not being evolving, aware. Yeah. yeah, and being and, aware of an actual threat. And that one takes longer to emerge and that's why I think you really need it. If you're you investing understand the in company. individual companies, you need to understand the company, where it sits in its wider industry, who the customers are and even what their future needs are, you kind of got to be a little bit of a futurist in like researching how that industry is evolving and what that company might look like in 10 years. Yeah, like if you own Woolworths, like what's going on with Aldi, you know, and Costco. Yeah, but even is the, like if Woolworths hadn't started offering online delivery and they hadn't started creating an app and they hadn't created online portals, you might be very worried because yeah. customers want delivery. They want click and collect. They want all sorts of things. And if Woolworths had done none of that, which they've done pretty well. I've used their online delivery and it worked mm -hmm. fairly well. You'd be worried. That would be a warning yeah. sign. Yeah, for sure it would be. All right. The next one is Your a fun one. Favorite. I think a little bit more of a complicated one, but if a company has legal and compliance issues, uh, maybe ASIC's investigating, they've got a current court mm -hmm. case in progress. Uh, many companies have legal issues at one time or another. Um, some of the big companies in the US probably have, I'd say Apple would have like, dozens of court cases yeah, on the Google go at any one well, time Facebook, uh, Facebook. Um, for all different reasons. And it could be whether it's an employee um, bringing an unfair dismissal case or it's a patent issue where one company is saying the other stole its patent or that they came up with the idea first, or it could be an issue where there was a product failure and someone got seriously injured, the car crashed. Um, yep. There's lots of different issues and this one is probably one that takes a little bit more research and be, can be harder to understand the full mm. picture. Yeah, this one, as I was saying to you off air before, this one is mostly for the absolute dogs, the companies that, um, yeah, if you get ASIC notifications and if you get ASX issues saying like the ASX questioning your company, Typically, it's because you're invested in a company that's really dodgy. So um, there have been examples of this happening before, like where a company in Australia, you can look this up called I Sign This, trades under the ticker symbol ISX. That's Is it still trading? I, I don't think it's trading. It hasn't been trading for I think, a couple of years now. But that was, I believe this was a company that did like um, payments and um, digital kind of like payments. I'm pretty sure what it was. Uh, and that's still getting brought before the courts now. Um, another company was a company called, uh, it's like an investment trust called Benjamin Hornigold, um, which was, it, it, it's colloquially known as the pirate because there was this guy from, I think he's from Queensland, who, um, <laughs> it's a bizarre story. He actually started all these different companies and named them after pirates. And then they all owned bits of each other on the ASX or not on the ASX. And he would go on these videos and he'd be like, yeah, like gold is going to go up like 50% and I, this is how much we own of it and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, turns out the thing went nowhere and all the shareholders revolted. There was a full on like legal battle um, and people ended up in, stuck in some of these funds for like a year or two while they while it was suspended. There's a more complicated example and something that you can't really ever know, which is Nuix. Nuix is the company that does data analytics and um, in, like kind of like analysis and it's actually used by ASIC. This is the ironic thing. ASIC actually used this to analyze data and information. And the software promises to be really impressive. But the reality is that the company just hasn't been able to deliver. There was a whole heap of issues with the IPO and the company's just plummeted, like absolutely plummeted. And so those have all been red flags along the way. And the way you could have determined them um, is for Benjamin Hornigold, you could have realized this guy was just a joker. Like he's naming, naming his companies after pirates and he's getting on a video and having all these bold claims. If you looked into his story, he, he claimed to be a, I think he was like a 
prof- not, he claimed to be a professor, but he wasn't, um, at a university in Queensland. Um, and he taught like arts. And yet he was some sort of investor that the world had to like bow down to. Uh, I signed this was just, there was just too many, too many promises. Like there was just way too many promises. Newix was a bit different because it was an IPO. It was a big prominent company. But um, I guess maybe the, the warning sign was that you shouldn't buy IPOs. Like IPOs, particularly when the market's doing really well, are pretty um, dodgy at the best of the times. So like when you're an investor, you got to remember that on every whenever you buy shares on every other side of the trade, there's someone selling. And in an IPO, you're buying it typically from an investment bank or from an insider or a long-term investor. So you're buying from someone who knows the business better than you do. Yeah. So that you've got to know that. And there's a lot more money to be made in an IPO than just normally buying and yeah. selling shares. Exactly. There's so, so many different interests. Yeah. And th- But I will actually say that there are many instances where there are amber flags. So for example, um, Cochlear, which is the implantable hearing aids, that had a product recall. I think it was the CEI 500 or something. That had a product recall. Uh, Cochlear was also sued for patent infringement in the United States. But every time that happened, this is a company with a very long-term track record. It was able to withstand that because it had cash in the bank or it did a capital raising or it had you know, a good brand or whatever. But some companies can't. Apple gets sued. I can't count the amount of times that Alphabet, aka Google, has been sued for data rights or unfair, you know, um, like what do you call it, antitrust. Mm -hmm. Like it's always happening. So in some instances, it's not always red flags. It's just when you get down to the bottom of the ASX where it's like really dodgy. Yeah, I'd I'd say legal issues would be even more important if you're looking at really small micro caps. Yeah, because they can't can't survive. Large companies like Apple, they've got, as you said, lots of money in the bank. They've got big teams of lawyers. They're getting this on a daily basis. They win some, they lose some. Um, And they've got a lot of... They've got a big diversification. They've got a big moat. So yep. there's a lot of other things going on. They Whereas can, they can a small fend company them off. that only has one product, if yep. that got something something happened to that, if that yep. got recalled or if that got their patent. Um, yeah, if you look at, um, say, Nearmap in Australia, it's been sued by, I think it was Eagle View in the US for infringement of something. And speculation, allegedly, it is that um, Nearmap kept going even though it knew. And so that's been fined um, and you can look at the share price and see what impact that's had. And that was a business that was successful in Australia, but it wasn't huge by global standards and that's really knocked it around. So, yeah. Yeah. And something that uh, if you do some research, you might start uncovering these things. Yeah. A will. lot of this is in the public domain if there is a, a court case underway. So you can find these information, but yeah. it can be hard to interpret and see what that all means. But a lot of people get spooked out of, say, Google having... Um, you know, there's a big, the big thing in the world at the moment is like what happens with data and privacy. And the other big thing is like are Apple, Microsoft, Google and Facebook too dominant? And the, the regulation will come in. Uh, and what that scares a lot of people. People see that as a red flag. I see that more as like an amber flag, more of a distraction for a company. Because even if they break up the company, you just own different parts of different companies um, or like parts of different companies. So you won't have one big company called Apple or Google, you'll have Google search and then you'll have Google workspace and you'll own all those different parts. I feel like that would be really annoying (laughs) if they split up Google into like 10, 20 different pieces. Yeah, but that could happen. So that's the fear anyway. All right. Next one is a probably a fun one, stock or company promotion. And we see that sometimes, especially in the smaller companies in the ASX, when the CEO is spending a lot of their time talking to media and posting on Twitter or forums about how wonderful the company is, all the things in the works, and really trying to get more people buying that stock and pushing the price up. Yeah. I mean, this is, this, so this is a, for me, this is a red flag. Um, it's not always as obvious as it would seem. So sometimes it's not even just like the CEOs or management teams. It can be like randos. Um, and what happens, particularly in the ASX and the smaller companies, the companies do what they call IR, investor relations, and PR, which is public relations, and they spend a lot of money on that. And that will be evident further down the conversation. But um, they spend a lot of money on that to push their stock price up so their, val- their value of their company is worth more. They get bigger bonuses and whatever. A lot of uh, CEOs in smaller companies are incentivized by the financial performance, so like revenue, sales, 
uh, profit, whatever, but they're also incentivized by the increase of the share price. Um, and so that's obvious. They'll just try and push it up as much as they can. They'll say whatever they can. But um, uh, some companies, and I'll give one example of a company called Brainchip in Australia, which is this company that promises to have, um, you know, fantastic technology, a key to neuromorphic chip processor, like wonderful stuff, like computing at the edge. Uh, it sounds fantastic, right? And if it works, it will be fantastic. And by the way, I've got, I copped a lot of shit for this on social media for, for speaking out about brain chip. Even if I don't say bad things, I get a lot of shit about brain chip. So just full disclosure. Um, but the one thing that I've noticed is that there are the only kind of videos that I can find are very promotional. So they're done by like YouTubers or media outlets that aren't actually media outlets. Like people think they are, but they're actually paid for. Um, media outlets so if i see things in like stockhead the market herald or whatever i think that's just a hot copper no um because that's i can't trust the information and um, i've seen some videos on this company that seem like really promising like this is going to change the, the world and all this sort of stuff and sure it might but it just seems promotional. So for me, that's a red flag. If a company might be associated with that, I mean, they might not be responsible for it. It could be someone else doing it. But at the same time, I'm like, oh, I just think that that's, for me, that's a red flag. It, yeah. It, yeah, it, it is. Yeah. And I think another point, it's slightly adjacent to this one, but if the CEO is spending all their time building their personal brand rather than the company, and you see this sometimes where CEOs like jet setting all over the world, going to conferences and doing all sorts of promotional activities that are mostly focused on them and building their brand yeah. uh, rather than actually spending time running the company. And yeah. I mean, the role of a CEO looks different across any company, but uh, it's good to think about are they actually being the visionary and leading the company or are they just uh, focused on their own career? Yeah, it happens. Yeah, it happens. It's probably not as prominent in Australia as it is overseas. There are many big founders overseas that are treated like you know, there's this thing that we have in Western culture, which is, um, I find it a bit annoying, which is that um, the Forbes or magazines and whatever will do the most successful lists. They'll be like most successful. And actually all it is is just most rich, um, like wealthiest financially. And um, being wealthy and starting a company does not mean that you are somehow better than other people. And yet, a lot of these people are thrust into the limelight and they love it and CEOs as well love it and they thrive in that environment. Um, but that does not necessarily mean that, you know, it's, it's a good thing or you're, you're a good thing um, necessarily. But when company people rise to the top, they often take that as an, you know, they're like fantastic and they get really egotistical and um, it becomes this whole thing, an whole industry around it. And, um, I find that the best CEOs are the ones that just kind of stick their head down. They do a little bit of media only when results come out and the rest of the year they're just working on the business. They're just like, we're, they're going to the factories, they're speaking to people, they're recruiting. That's what they do. Mm -hmm. They don't get out there on every video and do everything. Yeah. So, Sometimes yeah. you see companies where it's like the managing director or the chief operating officer who's kind of running the show and the CEO is doing all of that stuff. Yeah, so. and that can work too. Yeah. So so that definitely happens overseas. It's bigger than it is here where the CEO doesn't actually do anything like this. It's the COO, the chief operating officer. They do all the day-to-day. -day. Basically, everyone reports into the COO. Um, and then who reports into the CEO is like all of those other people. So the COO, the chief marketing officer, the chief technology officer, um, the chief like legal counsel, they'll all report into the CEO. So the CEO is kind of like a manager of managers, of managers and management, depending on what the company is. So yeah, that tends to happen. And the CEO's job is just to front investors. But um, I heard an interview on the Tim Ferriss show uh, last week with the Duolingo CEO. And he was saying that when he did the IPO, he made an agreement with the investor relations team. He said, I am only doing six hours of investor relations, like speaking to investors, doing that every quarter. And they said, well, you need to give us a little bit more than that. So he agreed to 12 hours. Um, so 12 hours every three months, he does the thing where he like speaks to CNBC, speaks to investors, speaks to this. Yeah. the rest of it, he's just doing the business. And that's and that for me as an investor, I think, wow, that's, that's what I want. He's put some boundaries in yeah, place. Yeah, he's, he's focused on running the business. He's yeah. not you know, doing all these other things. That's exactly what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I like that.
Yeah. Because yeah. it's easy to fill your time with lots of interviews and things like that and not actually run the company. Yeah, for sure it is. All right. The next one, remuneration and incentives, a.k.a. Who mu- how much is each person getting paid and what are they going to get for doing a good job? Yeah. So um, I feel like I've just ripped on a bunch of different companies. I'm going to rip on one more, <laughs> um, which is maybe two more, three more. I'm just looking at my list. Uh, <laughs> so this company... Um, this company is a company that I recommended. So Mia Culpa here, um, Dubba is the name of the company and it uh, claims to be a scalable SaaS business it yet makes more and more losses every year. Um, Dubba is a business that does voice recording and transcription. So if you are, it's Melbourne based too. Uh, if if you are um, like receiving a call or making a call and it goes to like a call center, in the past, that would be done through like big servers and you'd have like whole teams dedicated to managing that. Uh, but now you can just get it through cloud-based stuff. Yeah, when it says this call may be recorded for quality and compliance purposes. Yeah, exactly. And it happens in banking, insurance. Um, it happens in like even big customer service like airlines and that sort of stuff. They all do it. And that call, by the way, can actually be monitored um, using machine learning, which is what they claim to do, um, which is... You can, it can analyze the words and it can do sentiment analysis. So basically like if you're, so during COVID, I think it was Qantas that used Dubba technology. They um, were able to see that the morale of staff had fallen because everyone was getting canceled flights, angry customers. And so they could see that staff morale was falling. So that voice recording wasn't actually tracking. So it was picking up the tone and the words they use, was it? Yeah. Hmm. And it wasn't actually tracking um, what had happened to, the customer's experience necessarily it was looking at the staff and thinking out oh, geez our staff need to pick me up we need to do something for our staff and so that's how it can be used anyway this company has the most skewed incentives i've seen it if you look at its income statement it has directors fees which shouldn't be on there those should be in the uh, in employee and benefits expenses or just a note further down because they shouldn't be that big um then they've got um, another one for like uh, equity incentives or like stock, stock-based compensation. Then they've got their actual like empl- employee and wages expense. So there's like three ways that they're paying back senior management basically. And um, they all, I, I don't know where to start, but basically like they earn incentives based on the number of networks that they sign up. So like if Telstra joins, if Optus joins, if BT, tel- like British Telecom joins, if S- Spirit or whoever joins, right? Um, but the the reality is to actually do that costs them nothing. So the cost Telstra nothing. It costs, them. yet for Dubber, that's what they're incentivized on. And it doesn't actually make them, so it doesn't make them money, but that's what their incentive is. So they're just going to keep doing that even if they don't get anyone, even if it doesn't make any money, they'll just keep doing that. Um, and so I have, yeah, like, yeah, I mean, I've written about You've got a lot of internal feelings about it. Yes, I've got a lot of feelings. But (laughs) the moral of this story is for Red Flags, what we want is we want companies to have management teams with um, shares that they own and then we want them to have um, long-term incentives. So things like um, where they earn bonuses over, say, two, three, four or five years. The best example in the world that I've come across is Mercado Libre, which is a... American listed company. It's the Amazon of South America. M E L I is the ticker symbol. Um, check that out. Mm. Yeah. Awesome. Now, second last one, which I'm sure you'll have some thoughts on because I don't have that many, is selective reporting of key metrics on yep. annual reports and financials and things like that, which is something that listeners can find quite easily. Yeah. So uh, in uh, the United States, we use something called um, GAAP accounting, which is US GAAP. So it's US and then G A A P. Um, it's generally accepted accounting principles. And then in Australia, we follow the international standard, the International Financial Reporting Standards or IFRS. So those are the two different reporting standards around the world. IFRS for Australia, GAP for US. And um, so basically that sets the rules of what companies can and can't say in their reports. But that only really applies for the uh, audited financial set, uh, statements. If you go into the investor presentation uh, in Australia, there can be all types of weird and wonderful things like normalized underlying EBITDA, which is like normalized underlying earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. Can it get any more complicated? Could it get any? It can. I'm about to get more complicated. (laughs) Um, Whereas in the US, I think the rule is if 
you present one financial metric, you have to present the equivalent um, gap accounting measure. So there's a bit more stringent. Uh, it's a bit more stringent there. Uh, and so the basic idea is that some of these companies use all types of weirdness, uh, and you will come across this wherever you invest. But the key thing is to look at how they define those weird things. There was one, I think, from WiseTech, which is an Australian technology company that does logistics software. This company uh, had this metric, which they said refer to the glossary. Then you go to the glossary and it says refer to this other page, which didn't actually exist. <laughs> so, I mean, so yeah. this can happen. Uh, it, and this happens all the time. But in exa- an example of this done well in Australia is a company called Pushpay. Uh, it's a Kiwi company that's listed here in Australia and it does church donation software. It's a company that we recommended for a long time. I uh, don't own it anymore. Uh, and it quotes EBITDAFI. So EBITDA, Charlie Munger calls EBITDA bullshit because it's not actually an accounting standard thing, but all the companies use it. EBITDA, you've probably seen it in our articles or wherever. Uh, and they actually added two more letters on the end, F and I. And for push They just made their own acronym up. Yeah, they did, oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> and it actually made sense though for this company because when they went into the definitions, you could see that it was before like foreign exchange, which uh. foreign exchange, it probably shouldn't be included because companies could include it on a good year or exclude it on a bad year. Yeah. Um, and there's a company in Australia called Treasury Wines, which owns Penfold Estates and Wolfblast and many other wines. If you drink that, um, have me over because I can't afford it. But um, Treasury Wines uses this thing called Sagara. S-G-A-R, S-G-A-R-A, Sagara. And that basically remain, that stands for the self-generating and appreciating assets. <laughs> so they like exclude a things. self-generating asset. Like a, like a vineyard. A oh. vine gets more valuable when it's right. growing to a certain uh, vintage and then it becomes like after a long time. So then they it dies have to off. get a, a vintage, like a wine value in. They'll to, get a value in to do to it. value the vine. So that you want to exclude that and just focus on the cash profit and whatever. So that makes sense. The big banks, by the way, you use cash profit. Anyway, I've, I've rambled on for too long, but the idea is that if you are in doubt in any way, refer to the definitions and make sure get one year statements and make sure they're comparable to the last year statements because they will change definitions. And the other thing is, if in doubt, go straight to the cash flow statement, look at cash receipts and cash from operating activities. Those are your things that you have to go to. Yep. Um, the audited financial statements are what you need. Yeah. And we're also talking off air as well about chart crimes when oh, yeah, companies will yeah. compare two different data sets together, but they'll change the axes or they'll um, compare and they'll make the 25% look a lot bigger than the 50%. And they'll just, yeah. they'll yeah compare weird sets of data that make them look good, but aren't actually giving you a true indication unless you look at the really fine print of what's going on yeah we had a fantastic listener wrote into us when i giggled about vanguard's pie charts and he wrote in and said here's all the reasons that you don't use pie charts which is fantastic i loved it um but companies are the worst if you look if you want chart crimes like look at any company um, but also investors do this too like investors will be like look at the s p 500 versus the price of kfc burgers and they'll be like it matches, therefore it works. Um, this type of stuff happens all the time in finance, but a lot of those things, I was taught when I studied physics, um, the first thing you do when you ever come across a chart is look at the axes. And if you do that, then you know. Yeah, and look at the time frame, look at the data source, yeah. all those sort of things. For sure, Like Absolutely. we were just looking at a few share charts the other day and it, if you look at the one day, it might look amazing and then suddenly you look at all time and it paints a very different picture. So I think it's really important that um, if your app defaults to one day, five day, one year, that you really zoom out. And you do that when you're looking at a super fund or anything like that. Yeah, well, we always talk about being long-term investors. Yet all of almost every brokerage account, except for one that I know of, which is Perla, all of the brokerage accounts default to intraday, yeah. which is like daily pricing. Yeah, because sometimes for these individual companies, if you look at the long-term chart, it does not paint a pretty picture. Yeah, so you want to look at the long-term chart if you're a long-term investor. Yeah. So that makes sense. Yep, like All it. Right. Last one. Final one is track record of broken promises and dreams. Yeah, so uh, companies will always try and reassure you when times are dark that, hey, things are going to get better in two years. Uh, we're going to have profit. Well, go back and check it. 
Um, the easiest way is just to keep notes on the companies that you own. Like yeah. Download just, their statements, take yeah. screenshots. This is take a good time to keep receipts. Even just like write down a paragraph or um, bookmark an article that you read of a company's results this year and then see how it goes. Uh, go back to it. Did they actually live up to what they said? Um, sometimes they'll try and make that statement or the information disappear. Yeah, and they will. Yeah, so that's what it comes back to official ASX the definitions release. that we just talked yeah. about. So they'll start saying, well, yeah, things are bad right with our profits right now. Yes, we're making losses. But if you look at our cash balance, it's looking good because they've just like gone to the bank or whatever. Um, our cash balance is looking good. And then next year they're like, yeah, you look, our profits are getting – our losses are getting better and then they've – Move the cash thing out, and now they're yeah. like, "Well, well they have a lot money, more money now because they sold part of their business. Yeah. So suddenly they've lost part of it. But hey, we've got more money. Or yeah. same with like acquisitions. They're like, "Oh, we've added ten thousand new clients this year. Yep. But they didn't actually add anything in the core business. It was from this acquisition well, that they paid did. for. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so that happens a lot. We see, you know, companies they come out and they say we're going to make this much profit. I always give companies a bit of grace here because I'm like. I know how hard it is to be like investors want certainty in the stock market. If you say you're going to make a hundred million dollars of revenue and you get 99.9, you're, you're done. You're the worst ever. And they, the stock market's going to sell off. Yeah. Um, when, if you run a business, you know how basically impossible it is. To, to meet your goal. Exactly. Yeah. So you know that. And so if you're a long-term investor, like if you own a share for three or five or 10 years, there are going to be periods in that time where your shares are down 20, 30, 40, 50%. There are going to be periods where your company does not meet its guidance and its financial forecast. It just doesn't. But it's about, okay, it didn't make it. What did they say? What's the explanation? And did they meet most of them over time? Did they still deliver in other ways? Yeah. And that's the key thing. And looking at it in context, like the goals that businesses set it themselves in January 2020, when they reported in July 2020 that was very different yeah mm. there was like a tale of two halves yeah. uh, if you like you okay. could not have envisioned it and companies can't envision everything that's going to happen yeah a, a company um th- what tends to happen is a company does make promises 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 and the share price goes back up because oh, okay it's things that are looking good and then they do a capital raising so companies aren't silly they know if they do a capital raising which is where they sell more of their shares to get f- funds in to keep their business alive um, they want to do that at a higher share price so then they get a better deal. And um, the companies will make promises, 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 and then do the capital raising. Then the shares fall. So you just got to be mindful that that's probably, you know, you'll see like the narrative change in, in companies' reports over time. And so, Kate, that brings us through the 10 things. There yes. was a lot of things. So let's just quickly recap. Big them. list there of uh, potentially red Green, amber flags. Yeah, we've got poor ish, poor approach to ESG issues, poor treatment of employees. Uh, we've got the key, key people leaving, like the C-level. Yeah, or without any notice or... Yep, happens a lot. Lack of insider ownership when they don't own shares. Um, jumping on the bandwagon or ignoring like really yeah. structural changes to an industry. Legal issues that constantly appear. Companies promoting and pumping their stock as it's known on social media remuneration and incentives all over the place remember that example of someone that you know their incentives aren't tied to long-term financial performance um reporting only the metrics that they want to report at certain times and then finally a track record of broken promises that's a lot yeah and they're not all going to be a thesis killer but yep. they might add up to something that means you don't want to invest in that company or you might see some of these as when this happens to the company, it actually might be a great time for you to invest. So yep. um, they're not make or break things, but I definitely think they're worth investigating and understanding and including when you're writing down your reason for buying a company or continue to invest in the company, actually writing down a little bit once you reflect and research into these further. Yep, I like it. Um, and to extend your knowledge, to keep this going, because there's a lot to take in, uh, our Value Investor Program on RASC Education covers all of this in that there's the 42-step checklist. But also the Australian Investors Podcast, which is the yellow podcast that's actually growing in popularity, which is fantastic. It keeps going up the rankings. Um, the Australian Investors Podcast, I interview guests who share all of their investment process and they talk about their red flags and their green lights and whatever, not just Matthew McConaughey's 
green lights. Um, cool, Kate. That's a, a hell of an episode because we covered a lot of ground. Yeah. Um, Ten red flags for people. Hopefully, and not too many. And lots of examples of companies that they yeah. could go and research into further. Heaps of companies. Good case there. studies. Yeah, we'll see how Double reports. ASX DUB is a ticket code. I'm not expecting good things, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> there's a there's a forecast for the end of the episode, so <laughs> uh, make of that what you will. <laughs> uh, but Kate, as always, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks for listening, everyone.